So you've been thinking, should I start a poultry firm or I shouldn't? A lot going on in your mind. Will it work out? Will it not work out? Well, I'm Daniel, a practicing medical doctor, and about 11 months ago, I started a poultry farm. And hey, I'm not doing so badly. I didn't have a lot of resources, but I had my brains. In this video, I'm going to let you know whether you should start a poultry farm or not, if it's a good idea for you or not. By the end of the video, you'll be able to think and decide on your own whether you should start a poultry farm or you shouldn't. Stick around. The story that I'm going to share today, most of you might think that it doesn't make sense. So many young African doctors are removing this apron. You know why? Because they believe that there's more to wearing this. I think my mom thought um, somebody has jujued me because I quit engineering to focus on what I love. And this is what is happening with the generation of Africa we have right now. Listen, I'm in Uganda. And everyone is telling me that I cannot leave Uganda without meeting this guy. I feel like he's the real ambassador for Uganda to the world. You know why? Because he's inspiring so many Africans across the globe. I think I was in Zimbabwe and a Zimbabwean farmer was telling me that this guy actually inspired him to leave UK, come back to Uganda and also start a poultry farm. That's yes. amazing. Oh yes, YouTube. There's also a guy from um, Uganda. What's his name? Farm up. Farm up. I know what's farm his, up. What's his name? I'm Dr. Daniel and I've been doing farming for about four years right now. I started out with a rather small farm, just half completed building, 750 chickens, make that 800. On land that wasn't my property, my father's land, and that has already expanded into what? 400 acres of farmland, more than 20,000 chickens, over 150 cattle, over 700 goats and sheep, plants and crops, and of course there is way more being planned. I'd rather be a farm guy, smiling at the cute birds. I'm a very passionate poultry farmer, and um, I do breeder farming in terms of poultry. We probably own the biggest, or one of the biggest breeder farms in Uganda, and maybe in East Africa at large. What were people telling you when you quit your uh, medical People told me I'm crazy. People told me you're crazy. Well, I knew what I was doing. And despite all the thoughts and comments of people, well, I believe I was crazy in my nice way. Imagine you travel to the US and a white man asks you, where are you from? You say, Uganda. They'll imagine a child with a, a pot belly here who is very hungry and everything. But I personally, when I think of Africa, I think of good weather. I think of abundant food. I think of a rich culture. I think of a lot of joy. It doesn't matter what they might have moved to a lot of places in deep villages in Africa. I always find happy people. Even with what people perceive as poverty, you'll find the people are happy. They are smiling. You find them running around in the compounds, jumping the kids. Are, you, you find 10 children in one homestead, but they are all happy. Maybe they didn't even have breakfast, but they are all happy. And in the end, when we are, we are, we are all dying on our deathbeds, if, you're not, if you never lived a happy life, everything else is useless. Are you a billionaire or a millionaire? I'm happy with what I have. Ah! <laughs> Rock, I, wanna, I don't want to talk too much because you are just here. It's a pleasure meeting you, man. It's a pleasure meeting you too, Whoa, Maya. finally. <laughs> finally. Is that how here. you walk every day? This is how I am every day, you know. Because in your videos, this is how you look like. Exactly. You, see, you find me on the farm. This is my farm uniform. I want to ask you a question. Yes, please. You are a medical doctor. Yes, I am. And you decided to quit. Yep. Please. Is everything okay with your brain, man? <laughs> I believe I'm in perfect condition, actually better than most. Oh yes, because I feel like this is the best decision of my adult life. What were people telling you when you quit your uh, medical? People told me I'm crazy. People told me you're crazy. Everyone else is, you find farmers and they look at a doctor and they're like, man, those guys are doing it good. Yeah, the doctors, the farmers want to go back to school and become doctors. And then I was moving the other way around. Everyone was like, 
Are you okay? Is, is everything all right with you? Well, I knew what I was doing. And despite all the thoughts and comments of people, well, I believe I was crazy in my nice way. What is that one comment that made you nearly change your mind for going back? I'll tell you something. I was always certain I would never change my mind. Even Whoa. my mother or father would never ever get me to change my mind. Because we, we, we come alone into the world and we live alone. I never want to regret anything. When I'm 80 or 90, I, I didn't want to sit down and I'm thinking, what if I had quit when I was 29, you know? What if I had made that decision to quit? So I decided I'm not going to let anyone even make me feel like regretting. I just want to tell you something. Yes. You're an inspiration. Thank you. I, I've traveled across Africa and there's no single African country that I've been to that I won't get one person asking me, hey, have you met Dr. Daniel before? And I'm like, oh, thumb up? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I'm glad I can be an inspiration. That's the goal. I feel like that's the goal in life, to get people and as many people to, you know, a level that they would all be happy with. That's the goal, inspire as many as possible. What inspires you? What inspires me? For me, what inspires me is to be better and change the world, you know? Be better. What I know is that there's no ceiling for being better. If people look at Euro, people look at, you know, the US, for example, and everyone admires what the people have. But I feel like anyone can, you know? I don't have very great inspirations because I believe what they can do, anyone can do, as long as you've made up your mind and your heart. It's possible. No, dog, no. <laughs> you know, the youth of Africa thinks that it's not possible to make it in Africa. And you're telling us that, oh, whatever is in Europe can be done in Africa. It, actually, it can be done even better because I believe a lot of what is in Europe and in, 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 in North America is taken from Africa. It's all taken from Africa. They take it there, probably make a few changes and then bring it back to us like it's totally different technology. But I believe everything is available here. And if we avail our hearts and minds, anything is doable. What made you remove this white coat to what you wear it? Oh yes, in the end it's all about the money, isn't it? Oh wow. <laughs> okay. So, no, I don't understand. Yes. I mean, being a medical doctor, you should make money than being a farmer, bro. Because in Africa, we're trained that farmers are poor people. You're a farmer? Oh yes, I am. Are you not poor? No, I'm not poor. I'm not even close to being poor. <laughs> you see, um, people have what we call, you know, mindsets. Things mm. they always imagine mm. in mm. their heads, yeah? Mm. So everyone who wears a white coat, I think that, that, that's why they even call them white collar jobs. <laughs> they have a white collar over here. <laughs> you know, they expect them to earn so much money. For me over here, if I wake up and I learn from my mistakes, Tomorrow I put in hard work and do better, I could add 15 times what I earned yesterday. So it's limitless, it's, it's boundless what you can earn through farming, through businesses, in comparison to being in a, you know, an employment place. You know what, before I continue this video, I mean, see, now I feel like quitting YouTube and become a farmer. Because of what doctor is saying, see, I'm inspired, I just met him just five minutes ago. Do me a favor, I feel like we need to inspire many African youths. First of all, I want you to like this video. See, what this guy is saying, I believe that a lot of people need to get a piece of this. See, there is a share button. Share this video right now. I'm waiting before I continue. Doc. Yes, please. What does farming mean to you? Farming is a way of life. You see, for me, people always ask me, um, how does it feel to be a farmer after being a doctor all these years, being a student, and then you're moving around in an overall with gumboots, yeah. you know, you step in cow dung because you have some cut over here, you're, you're carrying your chickens. I know people who fear chicken. Mm. They're like, what does it feel like? For me, it's a way of life. It's something I could do forever. And uh, everyone needs food. Everyone needs food. So, you see, when I was quitting my medical profession, people kept telling me, you, you had a big impact treating someone. You know, someone comes to the, to the hospital when they are sick, you're treating someone. That was a big impact. Now you're quitting and going to farming. And I keep telling them, I believe this is even a bigger impact than I could ever do while, while being a farmer. Because in addition to simply sharing um, the food 
to the people, to the community. By the way, we do a lot of charity over here. Wow. Yeah, um, at Farm Up, yeah. We do a lot of charity. This community over here, on some of the days, Christmas Day, you know the days that people celebrate, yeah. Easter Day, we wow. kill animals and go and distribute to people in the village because they need to feel the impact and the benefit of having such a great farm on, in, in the area. So that's why I even chose to do a YouTube channel, you understand? Because I felt like people need to learn these things. It's, it's not simply for me. You see, before I started farming, people kept telling me that you don't need to share this poultry information. Yeah, that was the connotation in the world of farming. Because it's quite complicated, honestly. And while I was starting, it was quite hard. So people were like, if you know it, keep it to yourself. Don't share the information. That way you'll get a lot of competitors. But that's not how we grow, Maya, isn't it? I think this is the best video I've ever done. I don't know, I'm not even done, but I feel like this is the best video I've ever done, man. Um, Dr. Daniel has a YouTube channel called Farm Up. Hey guys, welcome back to Farm Up with me, Dr. Daniel, the passionate farmer. Pause this video, the link is in the description. If you aspire to be a poultry farmer, or even if you don't know anything about poultry, listen, when you watch him, <laughs> you will want to be a poultry farmer today. Do me a favor, the channel link is in the description. Subscribe to the channel right now. See, I need to tell you guys that I'm waiting eh? Doc. Yes, please. How did it start? I just want to know the journey, the process. So this is how it started. After my graduation, of course I decided to practice as a doctor, just like everyone else would. Mm. But then I've always been an ambitious person. I wanted to get some extra money. What we earn as doctors in Uganda here is not the best, honestly. It's not. So I had big ambitions. I was like, how am I going to do this? Hmm. I, I, while researching, I decided to do greenhouse farming. But while doing my greenhouse farming, I went and met an expert at greenhouse farming. This is before I start. Okay. I met an expert. This guy is supposed to tell me how to start greenhouse farming. After our conversation, he told me, hey, I would advise you to do poultry farming. So I was thinking, if an expert at greenhouse farming is telling me not to do it, then I can't. That would be stupid. I followed his advice. So I, I, I researched, got information, and I made up my mind I'm going to start a poultry farm. So of course I was a doctor. I kept, I said, saving my money little by little. You know, little by little. And at some point in 2019, on my dad's land, quite far away from here, I decided to put up a chicken structure. I didn't have money to even, you know, buy land. So I put up a chicken structure on my dad's land. And I brought in my first batch of birds. The first few months were quite tiresome. But after that, I got the gist of it. And I actually noticed this thing can actually make money. I was like, wow, you can act this thing can actually make money. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, my eyes were enlightened. They were opened up. So first, I told myself, I need to tell other people about this. So just to recap, the most important thing that should help you decide if you want to start a poultry farm is availability, commitment passion, location of the farm, and resources. If you can deal with those five, answer them, and you can handle all of them, then welcome to the business. You're ready to start your poultry farm. Secondly, I told myself I'm going to get this big. I do remember everything vividly. You see, this is my poultry farm where everything started a few years back. And I remember everything coming up because right now I'm in the process of building another structure in this area. So everything has flashed back vividly. Just how I was starting everything and it seemed so complicated. It seemed like I knew. I told myself we need to expand, get as big as possible. So that was the journey. So I started with about 750 birds, 800 ideally. I paid for 750, they gave me 50 extra, I got 800 birds. Started with that, started expanding. That was 2019. Mm. Started expanding. 2020, I brought in now 2,000 birds. And then in 2020, at the end of 2021, mm. at the end of 2020, then that's when this got into the picture. If you don't know this that he's talking about, we're currently standing on a 400 acres of land and what do you do in here? So this is 400 acres of land and I would even call it a mixed farm because it's not only poultry that we have over here. Okay. Yeah, so this is what they call a breeder farm. 
Now, a breeder farm is different from what they call a commercial farm mm. because it requires way more expertise and it's more complicated. A breeder farm is what supplies the smaller or the other commercial farmers, the chicks that they raise. Mm. You know, the chicks they raise for, for meat, those are broilers. Exactly. And the chicks they raise for eggs, eggs. those are layers. Yes. Those are supplied by me. So I, in particular, over here, don't raise any birds for meat or for eggs. I supply other farmers with these day oil chicks. So this is a breeder farm and it sits on 400 acres of land. Now currently we have 40,000 broiler breeders and we have another batch coming in this month on the 18th. We have more birds coming in on this very farm. So 40,000 broiler breeders on really huge structures. I believe you've seen them. Yep. Yeah, these, these structures measure 15 by 200 meters in length. 200 meters, that's the, the, the length Usain Bolt runs. <laughs> That's our, the length around, usually, you know, a half of a football pitch. Exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's really long. It's really, really long. And um, we also have this structure over here that you can mm. see. Mm. A very innovative and different kind of structure. How is it so innovative? This is a structure that you won't find anywhere in the world. I can assure you. Unless someone actually took the advice I, I keep sharing on the channel, and they did it. You won't find it anywhere in the world. So this is a two-storied structure. So why two-storied, first of all? My goal when I was starting a farm, it, you can see we have 400 acres of land, so we yeah. could actually build downwards. Exactly. But this was purposefully built to train and inspire people to actually use small spaces of land to do big projects. So over here, we have 5,000 breeders, layer breeders, hmm. down and 5,000 at the top. So this is a 10,000 capacity layer breeder house. But if you're keeping commercial layers, you can actually do about 15 to 18,000 birds in here. And if you're, if you're keeping commercial broilers, you can do 30,000 birds in here. Hmm. Now, because we are building upwards. Secondly, the thing with poultry farming is that it's quite risky. Yeah. It's quite risky because animals can die. That's why a lot of people don't do it. So what measures do we take to limit those diseases? Diseases are usually brought by someone, like you, Maya. You know, you could have brought something from outside. <laughs> you, you get it. So exactly. if you, you, you enter there, uh -huh. I have a risk that my birds could get sick. So the, the, the less number of times someone enters there, the less likelihood of introducing a disease. So everything on this house is designed in such a way that very few times are required to get in. So the, the water is automated, delivered by an automatic system. Wow. The food, is also delivered by a semi-automatic system. So we literally have three levels. Despite the fact that you can only see two stories, we have three levels. We have one at the very top. So on the side over here, maybe we can walk over there. So on the side over here, we have a ramp, which is the third of three mechanisms that can be used to take feed. So at the very end, I'm sure you can see a red drop. Yep. You see at the top? Yep. Yeah, that's a winch, yeah? That's a winch that can be used to take feed to the top, okay? So the, the winch is used to take feed to the top, but just in case it breaks down, because anything can break down. This is, you know, Africa, this is Uganda. Yeah. Things can break down. If it fails, then someone can go up with a wheelbarrow and take feed to the top. Sometimes, then we can also use an electric winch, which is the default mechanism. But for example, like right now, electricity has blacked out, then we are using uh, a manual winch. But if the manual winch fails, then we take the feed up with a wheelbarrow, you know, just pushing it. Who, who designed it? Me. <laughs> you, you source local materials. Oh yes, so everything, that's the whole idea. Everything needs to be done using locally available materials. Because a lot of what you see in Europe and, 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 um, and the, the US is expensive, really expensive things that people can't do from, from over here. So in my head, I sat down and was thinking, how can we get this same form of automation or semi-automation mm. and decrease the risk of bringing disease mm. while using locally available materials. So that's how we came up here. This is concrete and brick. Then this is, you know, timber, wood, poles and nails. That's all. And plumbing material. And you've built yourself a very strong house. This can last quite a number of years, very many years. It's a very strong material. If you walked inside there, you wouldn't even hear it shake even a little bit. And the weight of those birds is actually quite a lot. Yeah, they get really heavy. Wow. So the house is a strong house. The other form of automation we have is the laying boxes over here. Maybe we can walk close. So the eggs are picked by people from the outside. You, you don't want, enter. You never need to enter 
inside here to pick any eggs. Yeah? So what happens is that the chickens, when the chicken feels the urge to lay an egg, you know, you know the way a woman feels the urge to produce and push a baby? Exactly. Yes. So the chicken will also feel like pushing that egg. <laughs> so it comes inside here to push. So it will enter. Oh, or the inside. Entry, no? Oh yes, you can see them all around. So they get in, then so I, I think the eggs have been picked. Oh yeah, we have oh, some okay, eggs we over have some here. Eggs here. Yeah? So you, you can see some form of dirt, but this is this is not bad dirt. This is expected dirt. Because inside the, ch the chicken house we have litter. Mm. Yeah? So when the birds climb, they step on here with their feet, and those feet have litter, so this consistently remains here. Can I touch this? No, no, no. Don't touch it. Because of the of, of the risk of disease. <laughs> so there are some things I did. Yeah. So here you can see that we have some eggs. Uh-huh. Yeah. So this is an egg that we've picked from the inside here. So people will move inside here, the workers pick the eggs and put them on this tray. If these are breeding, these are breeding stock. Stock, right? Yes. So does it mean we've got male and female in there? Oh yes. We've got males and females on the inside here. Because the normal layers, they lay eggs through feeding. Yes. This so one is through crossing. No, crossing. no, no, no. So no. this is this is what usually happens. A bird is predestined to lay an egg, whether it mates or not. You understand? Yeah. But the, 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 the birds that, the, the eggs that you usually eat from the shop, from the layers, are not fertilized. So if, even if you incubated it, if you gave it to a chicken to sit on it, it would never no. hatch. Never. I, so these are fertilized. That's, that's, which means it has a male... A, a male, male sperm. sperm. So yeah. the ones that you usually eat from the table don't have a sperm inside them. These ones have a sperm. I, I, I used to be a poultry farmer okay. when I was growing up. Me and my dad. Okay. So I, I quite remember we had a local cock, cock, and all of, like um, the hen and the cock, yes. right? But we went to the shop and bought the eggs there, and then the the the, the, the eggs that the local hen produces, mm. we took it off. Yes. And then gave it um, the other ones. And we waited for over two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we waited for a long time. A long there was time. nothing. There was nothing. No, <laughs> no, no, no chicks were hard. Exactly. Oh my goodness. It's because they were not fertilized. Ah. Uh, yes. So that's now, why we now need the males. Why. My dad was like, what do you think happened? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> he thought it was witchcraft, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in Africa, a lot of people uh, believe in witchcraft. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very understandable. Oh my goodness. So, so those are the mechanisms we've put in place. This is a long house. This, is, this house measures 100 meters in length. 100 meters by 15 meters in width. Wow. So it's a long house, a really wow. long house, and it's a big house. Good. If you got a breeding stock, then it, it means you need to have a hatchery in here. Yes, you need to have a hatchery. We can walk over there. Yes, so here we have our goat and sheep project, or house, yeah? So before we've had quite a number of goats and sheep. In total, it was over 800. Wow. Over 800 goats and sheep on this farm. But then, as our focus grew more towards the chickens, we decided to, to downsize. And then we also decided to get rid of the older animals mm. so that we have the young, nice ones, you know, and develop better breeds. So currently, the numbers are down. This is the house that you can see over here. This is where they stay. So these little ones that you see yeah. are the kids and the lambs. So the adults have actually gone out to feed, yeah? So a currently it's been very, very dry, very yeah. dry. So during the day, it's so hot. So we let them out so that they go and eat during the morning hours when it's not too hot. Mm. Then they'll come back in the afternoon, drink water, because this is where we do have their water, and they can go back again after that, yeah? So we have about 300 goats and sheep at the moment. Where's the sound from? The sun moves. The sun? The, oh, the, the, sound. Sound. the sound. The sound is coming from the feed mill. So right here we have a feed mill and that's where we make our poultry feed from. You produce your own feed? In yes, we produce our own feed because we use too much feed. We use over 10 tons of feed every day. Total amount of feed used every day. Over 10 tons. So if you consider using that and you're going to buy from the outside, it's crazy expensive. You could never afford if you buy mixed feed. Does it, does it mean you have 400 acres, you definitely grow your own corns in here? Yes. So we grow our corn. The last season we planted 200 acres of, of corn on this farm. We are used to calling it maize. I think the Americans call it corn. What do you call it in Ghana? Maize. Maize, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. You've, you've become Americanized. 
<laughs> yeah, so we grow a lot of maize over here. Yeah. So we just harvested 200 acres of okay. maize. So we use as much of the land as possible to try as get and get as much as we can over here. Even the feed for the workers over here, we grow as much of the food as possible. Beans, vegetables, bananas, potatoes, everything. We have a section just for that, right on the farm. How many people do you employ? Um, on the farm we employ over 200 people. Over 200 people. The poultry workers alone are about 100. Um, so, and then you have the support staff and everyone else. So it's over 200 people of employees on the farm. Doc, you used to be a medical doctor. Yes. You were employed. <laughs> now you are employing people. How does that make you feel? I, I feel like it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give. So I feel happy, you know. When I was younger, you'd always hear people saying, you know, I'm an employer, I'm an employer, I employ people. Now, I'm not just proud of it, but I'm glad that I get to, you know, give someone something so that they can get to a particular point and maybe also have their own farm. All yes. these machines are for you? Oh yes, all the machinery that you see over here. You, it's you a farm. You didn't hire it? No, 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 no. <laughs> ah, it's a bit too expensive. I, I, I don't understand, you've been, in a, you've been doing this for how long? Five years? Five years. And you bought your own machine? Exactly. Which means this business is so profitable. Very profitable. I keep telling people that. It's, 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 it, it can have risks. And you see, the thing with business is that usually the risk here, the more profitable. Yeah. But risks can be averted. There's things you can do to prevent risks and protect yourself from risks. So the business is actually really profitable. All the machinery that you see here, you know, we have an excavator, we have maybe four tractors, there's a damper. All this machinery works on the farm. When we are planting maize and plowing, we use the machinery right here on the farm. Do you think we could have achieved it if you were a medical doctor? It would probably take me two lifetimes if I'd remained a medical doctor. Maybe two lifetimes. If, I, if, I, if God could give me 200 years, it could have been possible. <laughs> if you have a message to the youth like yourself, what would that message be? The youths need to understand that you can do anything if, it, if you put your mind to it, but not only put your mind to it, go outside there, learn as much as you can. There is information everywhere. There is information, there are people inspiring everywhere. There's loads of books. I spend a lot of my time reading books. Get as much information as possible, and from that information you'll get the best tricks and ideas that will take you to the top. So anyone can do anything, as long as you're committed, you have the desire, and you actually push through with it. So, Maya, this is our hatchery, a farm up, yeah? So this structure over here is where the magic happens. It's probably the most important structure on this farm over <laughs> here, yeah. So the eggs that we collect from the chicken houses, the ones that we, I told you not to touch, okay. those over there, when they are brought, they are put inside here, inside machines. Now, the reason we can't move inside because the level of sterility required here is, I would say, obscene. You need to take a bath. I, I need to take a bath and change our clothes completely and we go before inside we go there, inside. before we go inside. Yeah. So it's, it requires quite some work before we go inside. But on, on the inside there, all the chicks, all the eggs are put there. And once every week, we had chicks. So currently we are hatching about 120,000 chicks every week. Every week? Yes, 120,000 chicks. I'm a mathematician, you know? Yes. Uh, how, how much do you sell one chick? I sell one chick um, for the broilers, about 2,700 shillings in Ugandan shillings, and 4,200 for layers. Uh, so you'll just do the math yourself. Multiply that by 120,000. <laughs> a week, <laughs> in a month. As you can see, this is just phase one of the hatchery, yeah? So this other side, you can see it doesn't have a roof. Mm. We're going to roof it and we're going to expand the hatchery. But right where we are standing, you can see that we've already dug holes for foundation. You know, you can see different holes mm. right here. So it was already planned out and this will be phase three, which we plan on doing very soon. And once completed, this will be the biggest hatchery in East Africa. Wow. Biggest in wow. East Africa. I, I'm glad to be your friend. I'll tell all my friends that, hey, the guy who owns the biggest high tree in East Africa is my friend. I was counting your money, yeah? The money that you make. Okay. In a month, and it looks so rosy. Okay. Just want to know, what has been the major challenge that you faced since you started this? 
So there's loads of challenges. It's quite hard to categorize them into major, Whoa. a major challenge, but th there can be loads of challenges. Usually the biggest challenge, because for us in the poultry industry, the biggest cost is feed. Yeah. So despite the fact that I grow maize on 200 acres, mm. for me, it's a drop in the ocean. Like I've told you, I use 10 tons of maize every day. Of feed, every, of every, feed every day. So that's about six tons of maize every day. That's currently. That's before expansion. Yeah. So it means that I need so much maize. So at some point I need to buy. Now, just a, a year and a half ago, we were buying a, a kilogram of maize at 700 shillings. Last year in December, we were buying that same kilogram of maize at 2,200 shillings. So that means that the cost of the feed can double or triple. So you can imagine if, if suddenly you've maybe planned $200,000 to use to buy maize, just like that, you're going to spend $600,000. Yeah. That's money that needs to come from somewhere. You understand? So that's the biggest um, problem. You know, the very volatile changes in the cost of feed, mm. and they can sometimes properly eat, it, eat into your profit. And usually what happens is that when the prices of feeds become expensive, because we are a breeder farm, we sell these chicks to other farmers. Now those farmers also don't tend to shy away, because the price of feed is so high, they now don't want to buy the chicks. You understand? Eh? So that can happen. So it might decrease your sales here and there, but we've been lucky through the connection of the YouTube channel, through the connection uh, of, you know, using media and all these things, we always sell out. We always sell out. The, the price might come down a bit because the demand is a bit lower, but we always sell out due to the connections and of course due to the quality that we've, we've had to maintain. Another of the challenges is the labor force. You know, mm. the labor force, because um, workers are very complicated people. You know, I once learned from someone that if you want to succeed, make sure that you have as few work, human workers as possible. You can have other forms of workers, maybe dogs, maybe, you know, if other things can do the work for you, maybe computers. Yeah. But if you rely on human beings, you yes, they can switch minds. One person will always tell you, do something else. You tell them this, they do this. So because of that, it, it becomes quite challenging. You know, you keep training people, and then after some time, the person disappears. After some time, the same person who you trusted so much, you know, does something bad. You know, they, maybe they steal or things like that. So the labor force, the human resource itself, is quite complicated. I feel like those are the biggest challenges. And of course, the other one, which for us, luckily, oh, I wouldn't say luckily, but because of the measures we've undertaken, um, hasn't really affected us, is the risk of diseases. Like I've told you, just in case you didn't know, you're the very first visitor to ever step on this farm. Whoa. Yes, I don't allow anyone. So you're, you're very special, Mr. Meyer. Very, very special. <laughs> so I don't allow people to come onto the farm because of the risk of disease. Like we said earlier, diseases are brought by human beings. It's very unlikely that a disease will come from somewhere else. It's usually some form of contact, yeah? So because of that, we have to really minimize and a lot of times people, even people who watch my youtube channel they get angry at me they're like why don't you want us to come you know you keep telling us that you're training us and you're doing all these things but you don't want us to come and learn physically but you've seen the investment it's a lot of money so the risk is too high for me to gamble with bringing people here on the farm very very high risk so the risk of diseases and the need to continuously contain the, the diseases mm. is another of the challenges but that mm. one we've managed properly do you need more money to start up your own business or start up a poultry farm? Yeah. So the thing with starting a poultry farm is that you can start from anywhere. You can see where I am now. Mm. There's people who, by the time I started, had big farms, maybe 5,000 birds, maybe 10,000 birds. But they're not here. They, they probably might not get here in the, in, in the next 20 years or 30 years. Yeah. So I believe starting a farm and actually growing has nothing to do with where you start from. The most important thing is having the vision, having the right principles, and if you have some amount of money, even just $2,000, $1,000, you can start. Because I started with 750 birds, you know, 750 birds, that wasn't too much money. I didn't have land. I built the chicken house on my dad's land. I couldn't afford land, you can imagine, yeah? So, I believe you just need to work. You know, people always hit my inbox. I don't know if people hit your inbox and, tell, and beg you for money. They're All like, time. Dr. Daniel, I have this problem. Yes, can you send me this money? I want to start my business. Someone even sends you a business plan. They're like, I've made this business plan. All I need is capital. You know, can, can you give me this money? I, I, the thing is that I always tell those people, go and work. Get a job. Go and work. Then you will get some money in your pocket. That money 
you will understand the value of that money. All right. Then you go and use it. You're right. You will try to minimize the risk of yourself losing that money right. and you will give it the, all the attention that it requires. So that's what I did. I was working as a doctor. I saved what I could and I invested that little money in 750 birds and that's what has birthed everything that you see in my life. So anything can be started with. The most important thing is knowledge and a vision. Does the government of Uganda support poultry farmers? Oh yes, the government of Uganda has done, has put in effort to support poultry farmers around the world, but I personally have not seen a shilling of it. I know that it reaches some people apparently. You know, you can see it in news, in news you can see it in news, in, in, on TV, you know, with some cameras and going to particular places. I personally haven't received it. Do you, do you, do you wish the government to support you? Of course, I would love it. I would love it. <laughs> I would love that the government... You see, in the end, in the end, we all want to, to become better. Exactly. We all want to become exactly. better. What you're seeing yeah. over here, yeah. I feel, for me, it's just a drop in the ocean. Again, I believe we can become better and we can do even bigger things. But I feel like if the government would support the smaller farmers out there even more... I, I'm not outside here begging for the government's help. I, I don't think I will. But if they could support the smaller farmers outside there, that then the whole industry grows as a whole, as a poultry industry. Even I again, because then I have more people to supply my chicks too, if those people are supported. If you had a chance to change one thing in Africa, what will it be? If I had a chance to change one thing in Africa, it would be the mindset of our youths and of our people in Africa. A lot of the people in Africa have poverty mindsets. They imagine that they are poor. I was talking to a, recently I read an article in, the, in a newspaper. 39% of Americans mm. would not be able to solve a $1,000 emergency if they got it right now. Now that's a country that we believe is very rich. You understand? Just $1,000, 39% of them would not be able to afford that if it fell right now. If you take that to $2,000, maybe it's 80%. You understand? So I believe we are all at the same level. Mm. It's just the mindset that changes. That person will have a thousand dollars in the US, but he imagines, you know, he feels like he's rich. Over here, someone actually owns a lot of land, but they have a poverty mindset, very poor mindset. So if we open up our minds and we know that, what we, first of all, we are rich with what we have, our heritage, everything that we have around, we are rich. Second of all, if you can use what you have and your imagination, stop Stop thinking about going around and begging. When you see a white man, you go and beg. You see a white man, you go and beg. No, stop that mindset. I believe we can reach a point where we are the ones lending to the white man. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate you. Believe me or not, you're an inspiration and I hope these videos inspire so many youth out there. Do me a favor, like this video, go to his YouTube channel and subscribe to be part of his channel. Believe me, someday you'll be like a millionaire like him, yeah. I know he doesn't want to say that. He's <laughs> but, uh, your message to Africans watching us. My message to Africans wa watching us over here, you're better than everyone else. Africa is the best place in the world. And you have the ability, you have the raw materials for success in your head and in your life. Just go outside, explore, use what you have, and you can make it to the very top. <laughs> Mr. Gunner